Amen. Do you believe it in Getty Church? It means life for us. The Bible says that he is not the God of the dead, but he's God of the living. So as sons and daughters, we come before him and we are alive. We are living, breathing, and breathing out his grace. Amen. I want to show you a new song. Have you ever heard somebody say uh, the phrase, um, he's a, or she is a man of their word? Uh, this, this next song is called A Man of Your Word, and it talks about how God's promises are yes and amen. If he says something, it's going to happen. And so our job is just to believe him, to simply, like a child, just have faith and trust in him that he is a man of his word. All right, so we're going to teach you that real quick, and it goes something like this. If you said it, we believe it. And if you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your words. Try it. If you said it, we believe it. Hey. And if you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your word. All right, that's how it goes. Let's do it. See? 
together. Amen, amen. Yeah, he's worthy of your applause. He's worthy of your worship. Right now we want to just pray together as a church family. Every week we love to do this. Prayer requests come in all week long, and we have a prayer teams that pray for you. They think about you. They're thinking about you, and they're praying for you. And so if you have a prayer request, go ahead and text in Getty Prayer to the number on the screen or click on the link and uh, we'll make sure that our prayer team uh, gets your prayer request. If you have some amazing news of how God came through, we wanna hear about that too. You can also um, click on the link for that. But let's go to God together in prayer as a family and uh, we will uh, pray into the attributes of God and into who he is. All right, let's pray. God, we, we love you, Lord. It's such a pleasure to worship you. It's a pleasure to be in your presence. God, whether we're here in person or, 
or if we're in our homes, God, wherever we are streaming online, Lord, may your presence uh, be made aware to us. We want to feel you around us. We want to feel and be aware that, that you are present. And God, when you, when you speak to us, when you reveal yourself to us, Father, may we have unlocked ears, opening ears to hear, God, that we may hear it and that we may believe. Father, we pray that you will lift up all the prayer requests. And God, intercede on our behalf. All the prayer requests that have come in throughout the week, God, you know our hearts, you know, you know what we're going through, Lord, on top of this crazy pandemic, God, we're also going through some, some uh, tough times, some tough things. God, may your presence be with us, Lord. May, there, may we see miracles, God, on the daily. May we, see, may we see amazing things happen for your glory, God. May you fight on our behalf, Lord. And God, may we walk boldly on this earth, Lord, in your power, in your love, Father. May you give us the boldness as the, as the apostles and the, the disciples prayed. May we pray for boldness, God, to evangelize, boldness to, to be your hands and feet to a lost and to a dying world, God. We love you, Lord. We know that you are on the throne, and that's good news for us. That brings hope to my heart because it means that you are in control. It means that you're still sovereign. In the middle of the pandemic, we serve a sovereign God. So we cling to you. We put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. And we say, God, if you say it, if you say it, if you made a promise, we will believe it. We will believe. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Let's continue to worship.
with you today. Well, you may be seated. My name is Jordan, and I serve as a young adults pastor here at Engedi Church. And man, we are so glad that you're a part of this worship experience. Want to give a special shout out to all those who are a part of this online. So glad you're with us. And man, if you're here for maybe the first time, or if you've been coming to Engedi for a while now, and this is your church home and church family, we're glad you're here, and we would love to get you connected. Whether that is you taking Journey, our Journey classes, or you joining a cable group, or you serving on a team, we have plenty of ways that you get connected here. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull out your cell phone and text Engedi Connect, that's one word, to the number up on the screen, and that is gonna be your way to get connected. That's gonna be your way to get plugged in. Text Engedi Connect to the number on the screen, and we'll send you a link that you can go to, and it'll give you all the next steps that you can take. Now we have an amazing kids team here at Engedi that I don't know if you've seen what they have out in the in the lobby in the in the lobby space, but they have this thing called Takeout Church for your elementary age kids, which is a pizza box with like these activities and lessons in it for them to have fun and growing with their relationship with Jesus. Such a brilliant and creative idea for your kids. And so, man, if you got elementary age kiddos, make sure you head on over to that booth after our gathering time to grab one of those Takeout Church boxes, and then I'm, I'm sure it's going to bless your kids. And man, we got tons of other really cool things happening here at Engedi that we want you guys to be involved with and to be a part of. And so let's take a look at our church news.
I got baptized, I was really nervous. There was always something about my life that felt marked. I didn't really have like a faith. I didn't really believe in God. I grew up in a, a Christian household. So let's see, it was going into like my junior year of high school. I really started to fall away. Before Christ, it was a lot of up and down, but I found my escape and things. I think a lot of us often do. I felt like God was telling me, okay, it's time for me to get baptized. Like, why am I waiting? Why have I not fully submerged in this? Why am I not fully submerged? There's no reason to hide this anymore. Your life is a piece of the greatest story ever told. Yes, the story is full of joy, of sunny days, and reasons to praise. But like all good stories, this one doesn't come without the storms. The crushing challenges, the weakness we try to bury, the injustice that nearly breaks our spirit. It's in these moments when our Creator speaks, reminding us that we are part of the larger story. And in time, we start to see the suffering differently. We see that we are persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Compelled by an indescribable love, we learn to find the glory in the grit. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to see all of you today. Welcome to Engedi. Want to give a special shout out to our campuses. So, Engedi Grand Rapids, Engedi Espanol. Uh, we love you guys. Everybody joining us online. We know that so many uh, folks. I saw uh, on the way to church last week, I saw uh, a whole barn full of people that were meeting outside. It was so cool. They all got a TV in this barn. So I know there's a lot of you out like right now that out there who are joining us online. We want to make some noise. For, it, let me tell you guys something actually real quick that's fun. So we had, uh, we've had folks that have joined in Getty online, never been to a physical campus ever. And right now they're in the journey class starting to get uh, connected with in Getty and Grado. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So welcome everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So glad you're here. So my name is Brian, by the way. I should tell you who I am. And uh, I've been, it's important because I've been gone for the last four weeks. Every July, I, I take some weeks where I take a little bit of vacation, but take a lot of time to work on the teaching uh, for next, the teachings for this year. And, and uh, what I realized as I'm looking forward to the next 12 months or so, and as I've been thinking about what's coming and where God's gonna take us, here I've concluded two things. I concluded number one, uh, I've got no idea where this whole COVID thing is going, all right? I don't know when, when stuff's gonna be open, closed, and mask all. I don't know that. What I am absolutely convinced of, I think God wants to do some stuff over these next 12 months in your life. Everybody. I don't, I came away and I just thought, you know, God, I know that for the last bit of time it's really unpredictable, but I'm pretty convinced that, that you didn't like hit the pause button on what you want to do through your church. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I have to tell you, about what is to come. Now today, uh, it's funny, we were supposed to land this Glory in the Grit series a couple of weeks ago, and as I was really praying about today, uh, I felt like the Lord was saying, there's one passage that we skipped in that series, and I felt like the Lord was saying, we needed to come uh, back to it today. And uh, so if you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you would, if you're at home, 2 Corinthians 3 is where you're, we're going to be studying from. And the reason why I think that God was saying we need to come back to this text is because this passage uh, really looks at two fundamentally different ways of relating to God. And one of them, one of these ways, and by the way, whether you're a Christian or not Christian, we all tend to default to one of these two ways. So maybe you're online, you're just checking things out spiritually, you're probably going one of these directions, same with Christians. But one of them leads to life and spiritual flourishing, and the other not so much. And so I wanna take a look at this text. I think that's why... Uh, God would have us spend some time on it today. It's a little bit dense. I'm going to warn you. It's a little bit dense as we start reading. 
but just hang with me and we'll start to unpack it. So uh, chapter three and verse six, Paul, the apostle is writing here. He says, he, God, has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, and he's referring to the Jewish law in the Old Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory so that the Israelites, the Jewish people, could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory, brief though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even, I need some help with this, everybody say with me, more glorious. Oh, you guys are doing good already. I like that. So verse nine, if that ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? Therefore, Paul says, I like this. Therefore, since we got such a hope, we're going to be very bold, all right? We're going to be very bold, he says. And then he, and then he goes on, man, I love this so much. We're not like Moses. He put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant, the law, is read. It has not been removed. This is important, this next part, watch. Because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, Paul says, when Moses is read, when the Old Testament law is read, a veil covers their hearts. But watch this. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, how many know it's good news right now? When anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And I love these last couple of verses. In fact, first service, I started screaming by the time I was reading this, and I can feel it in the throat right now. I got warmed back up. So verse 17, he says, now, you're going to need some help me on this one. Now, the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what, everybody? Oh, that's so good. And then verse 18, oh, dial it by, I know, dial it down, Brian. Just get started. Verse 18, and we all with who unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we, we join right now together all over West Michigan, really around the world. We join in person. We join online. We join as those of us who have had our lives changed by Jesus. We join as those who are just beginning to ask spiritual questions. We're exploring. And our prayer this morning is one and the same, Father. Give us a way of relating to you that produces life and flourishing. We come to you honestly in pains and joys, and we say, meet us in this moment. We ask it with expectation in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, it's so good to be back today, and I want to just spend some time uh, unpacking this text. He really, Paul, the, who's writing, he really unpacks a couple of different ways that you and I relate to God, and they're really as common today, honestly, as they were all the way back when this, uh, this passage was read. One of the ways that was so common in the Bible for people to relate to God shows up first in Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus 34, and you don't need to turn there, but some, maybe sometime on your own, uh, God gives a man named Moses who was leading the Jewish people, he gives Moses the law or uh, the Ten Commandments and a lot of other teachings. And, and this really became how people related to God. It was through the standard that they were trying to reach. Okay, God, these are the good things we're supposed to do. These are things we're supposed to avoid. They, a whole list of things. Things like, you know, don't practice idolatry. Don't have things that are, you're passionate about that, that are higher than God. You're, you're more passionate about them than you are God. And have things like take Sabbath every week. Take a week where, where you don't work and you just rest and are rejuvenated. And, they, and, and the law had things like offer your first fruits to God. Take the first 10% of your income and say, God, I trust you. This is actually yours. I'm giving it back. So that was the law. And, and I know that, you know, that might sound like, oh, the law and all this might sound distant. But I honestly think, Many of us relate to God in this same way today. And so if I were just to ask you, hey, how's your relationship with God going? I've asked many people, as you might imagine, that question. And you would be surprised how often people immediately start answering that question by defaulting to activities. How's your relationship with God? Well, uh, my Bible reading is doing okay. 
Uh, I've been at church, so or I've been streaming, one of the two, you know, I've been pretty regular there. Um, generosity, I don't know. I guess I'm doing okay. And we default exactly to that same way of relating to God. It's saying, God, okay, there's some standards you have for me and some expectations, and I'm gonna live to that standard. It's one way of relating to God. Now, there's a second way of relating to God, and, and this way is not so much striving for God's standards as it is relating to God's spirit. It's a very different way of interacting with God. Now, I need to unpack this for you just for a moment. Some of you may know this, others may not. When you put your trust in Jesus, when you give your life to him and say, Jesus, I recognize that I I need forgiveness. I recognize you died on a cross to take the punishment that was due me. You took on your own self that when you were raised to life, you were so, so I could be raised to new life again. When you put your trust in Jesus, the scripture actually says that God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell in your life. We believe God exists as three persons in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when you put your trust in Jesus, get this, everyone, God the Holy Spirit comes to actually dwell personally in your heart. This is an amazing thing. I I love Galatians chapter four where Paul describes it. He says this, because you are his sons and you are his daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into where, everybody? Our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. What an amazing promise this is. The Spirit of God starts living in our hearts, and it's a very different way now to relate to God because watch this. Rather than striving towards an external and impersonal standard, now you are interacting with an internal and personal guide. How many think the second sounds a little bit better, right? Rather than just trying to to, to, to figure out what the rules are and the checklist and say every week, I'm trying to do the right things over here, trying to do the wrong, or avoid the wrong things, not try to do the wrong things. That's important. I don't want anybody quoting me. (laughs) Brian, very much, I heard him say clearly, do the wrong things. No, that's not what God wants, all right? But rather than just living towards a standard, you're relating to God in a personal way. Anybody amazed that God lives in your life, in your own soul? I mean, that's a crazy thing. It's amazing, everybody. What a great promise. And those are really the options that God is holding in front of us today. Do you want to strive for a standard or relate to the Spirit of God? Let me make it even more plain for you. I'm curious, I asked the first service this too. I'm curious, how many of y'all, anybody play pickleball? Anybody pickleball players? Put your hands up if you're a pickleball player in here. Okay, we got a few of you. Now see, I thought it would be more honestly because I don't know if you realize this, but pickleball is taking over the world right now. Do you realize that? And, um, and if you're online right now, let me know if you're playing pickleball. You put a little racket up there. Put a pickle on there, okay? If you're a pickleball player, put a pickle in the, in the comments. I'll see how many pickles we got. Now, now, pickleball has nothing to do with pickles, but it's a, the dumbest name for a sport ever. That's for sure. But, um, but I've heard about all these people playing pickleball, and I've wanted to learn. And so just this week, I'm very excited about this, my pickleball set arrived. Yeah, that's right. I know you're impressed, and you should be, all right? And... Uh, so I've got a pickleball racket right here, uh, and I'm excited. It says graphite on. I'm very excited about the graphite factor. And uh, I've never played. I've held it a couple of times now. Never played pickleball. So I need to learn how to play this sport. And my first instinct was I need to read the instructions. And some of you are, are like this. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my pickleball instructions out, right? And I'm going to start reading this thing. I'm going to get up on my rules here. And okay, I got that. And yep, I got this. And, um, okay, oh, yeah, all right. And, and I, I was overwhelmed. Anybody get overwhelmed by the rule book ever when you try it? Some of you are like, I've never even seen a rule book, right? Mom, I was getting overwhelmed, and I realized I'm going to be done with this whole thing. I'm going to find somebody who can actually teach me pickleball in a relational way. I'm, I don't want to just read all the rules. I want to find somebody who knows it, and they can just help me walk me through pickleball. That's what I want to do. So if any of you know how to play pickleball and you'd like to teach the likes of me, it's brian at ingettychurch.com. If you're thinking, is he shamelessly recruiting people from the stage to teach him pickleball? The answer is yes. That's what I'm doing right now. All right. I'm looking for somebody to teach me pickleball. Can I tell you, friends, the difference between reading a big old book about pickleball and actually having somebody teach you is the difference of two ways of relating to God. One is you're fixated on the standard. And boy, don't misunderstand me. God's word and his commands are a big deal. I'm not denigrating them in the slightest. I read the Bible every single day of the week. I love God's word, but it's different. One way relating to God, I'm trying to get his commands, get off the right stuff, avoid the wrong stuff. And the other way is saying, rather than just striving for commands and striving for standards, I'm relating to God's spirit. That's the second way. 
Now, a big part of what Paul was trying to do in 2 Corinthians 3 is convince us that actually relating to God primarily through his spirit is a better way to interact with God. And he gives us two reasons why this is so. First one shows up in verse six in chapter three. He says, for the letter kills, for the letter kills, the letter again, referring to the law of God, the letter kills. But he says, watch this, the spirit does what everybody? It gives life. Now, what's Paul mean by this? Well, the letter, referring to the law, the letter, the law of God, did one thing very well. The law is great at helping you realize what a sinner you are, okay? That's what the law is great at. You read the commands of God, you're like, I do not have this thing figured out. I have really got some problems. I've got a lot of growth areas. The law is great at that. Here's the problem with the law. It can show you all the things that are messed up in your life, but it really can't help you fix them. That's the problem. Imagine going to a doctor, and you walk into the doctor's office and you say, doctor, I, I, I've got something. I feel so bad. I feel so terrible. I don't know what to do about it. And the doctor, she looks back at you and she says, well, uh, here's the thing. You're right. You're sick. And not only are you sick, but this is like a deadly disease. However, I know I got no idea what to do about it. So I'll tell you what, you just go figure it out in a couple of months, months check in with me. We'll see. I, 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 th- I don't know about you. I'd be like, doctor, you're fired, right? <laughs> We're, we're done here because I'm not just coming to you for lack of diagnosis. I need some kind of solution or I need some path forward. And the thing with the law was it really didn't offer a path forward. That's why it says the letter kills. But watch this. The spirit gives life. Let me tell you what relating to God through his spirit does. When you have a connection with the Holy Spirit, he actually comes to dwell in your life. And listen to this, everybody. It's so important. God starts to change you from the inside out. And now... Instead of the things that God says are important being an obligation, you start to actually want to do those things. You, you start to, God says, hey, be a, be a generous person. And instead of being like, oh, I guess I should be generous. It says, no, no, no. Instead, now you've got a desire to be generous. And watch this. Oh my gosh. The Holy Spirit actually empowers you to start living generously. Instead of reading your Bible because you're like, yeah, Brian, for the 100 millionth time has told me get on a Bible reading plan and, and I'm, oh, I guess I should do it. No, no. Instead of a should do it, it's like, I want to hear the voice of God. I've got a new desire for that in my life. And watch this. Your Christian life, your spiritual life becomes not so much I should as I want to. Anybody want to move from I should to I want to in this place? I want to move to I want to. I want to move to a place where it's like, no, this isn't what I have to. It's what I get to do. And that's what happens when you relate to God through the Holy Spirit. He changes you from the inside out. and He helps give you this desire to live in a new way. And he empower- doesn't mean it's not still a battle. doesn't mean it's not still hard. He gives you a new desire, though. He brings life. It's one of the reasons why. Relating to God through his spirit is so good. But there's a second way. And, and to me, I don't know if this one's, this reason's, you know, stronger or weaker. I, it's pretty amazing to me. Second one, though, is check this out. This is now verse 11. Paul writes, and if what was transitory, if the law, he's talking about the law here, if what was transitory came with glory, he said, how much greater is the glory of that which what, everybody? It lasts. We're not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. Now, I need to give you a little bit of background on this. Exodus 34, I mentioned it earlier. God is speaking with Moses and he's giving him the law, not just the Ten Commandments, a whole list of instructions and commands of, you know, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And he's giving Moses this big list. And every time Moses would come back from these experiences with God, his face would be aglow. Physically, I mean, people would see him and they say, whoa, what's going on? And so because his face was glowing as such, Moses didn't want to see them to see as that glow would fade. He didn't want to see the fade, them to see the fade happen. And so what Moses would do is he'd actually, watch this, he'd put a mask on his face. Isn't that funny? I mean, in the time we're living in, maybe it's not funny, I don't know. But Moses is like millennia ahead of of, of pandemic preparation here, right? He puts a mask on his face so that nobody will see the glow fade. If somebody asks you, why are you wearing that mask? You say, I'm just, I'm just covering the glow, all right? That's all I'm doing here, I'm covering the glow. That's what Moses said. Now, what's interesting is you might think, well, that sounds awfully strange, uh, you know, putting, putting a mask on so it, you know, covers up the fading glow. But I actually think the same thing happens to us sometimes. 
You ever talk to somebody? Maybe you've been this, I have been this person. In January, you make some spiritual resolutions. You say, okay, this is the year. I'm gonna do the Bible in a year plan every day. I'm on it. I'm gonna get through this word of God that he's given me, Bible in a year plan. You're like, fired up, right? And then, or maybe it's like this year, I'm gonna serve my church. I'm not gonna let everybody else, you know, carry, carry the work. I'm gonna put my gifts into play. This is gonna be the year. And I'm fired up about that. Or this is gonna be the year. I'm gonna be generous. So this is gonna be the year that, you know, you get in a cable group. I'm not gonna do this whole thing alone anymore. And so you get, and you're fired up. Oh man, you got the glow of the January glow. It's a new year. It's a new time. And then I talk to you like in March. And all of a sudden, the glow faded a little bit, didn't it? I know my glow fades by March. You know, you're like, hey, how'd the Bible reading thing going? Oh, yeah. It was, I got into it, but like by January 4, I got off on my dates, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I just thought, there's no recovering. I might as well wait till next year, you know. Or, oh, how's the serving going? I know you're ready. You got God's giving you gifts and all that. Well, I, I did some research online and I even bumped into one of the Getty staff members, but I just never could quite get over the hump. We got real busy. And even though I talked to Jenny and she said, hey, we got some room for any kids. Do you have any room in kids? I think we probably got to have some room for kids. And, 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 and she said, yeah, we'd love to have you. But we got busy and it just faded. And the glow faded, friends. The same thing that happened back in their day happens to us. We get the glow because things are going to change. But then it fades. Can I tell you today that when you're relating to God, not just by striving for standards, but you're relating to God through the Holy Spirit, can I remind you today, the glow never fades. I don't know if you realize this, but most of what we invest our time and our money in will not end up going with us to heaven. Do you realize that? Uh, people, uh, it's funny, some people that I know that are on the, on the lake a lot, they're like, there are so many boats out here. And maybe some of you have been on boats or other people's boats. I got news for you. I love boats too, but guess what? That boat's not going to heaven with you. <laughs> you realize that? And you might, you might have a great house, and that house isn't going. Maybe you've got a great career, and you've got a title. I'm the vice president of marketing of XYZ Corporation. Thank you very much. And guess what? That title isn't going with you to heaven. St. Peter ain't going to be at the gate and go, oh, you're the vice president of marketing. Good Lord, that's amazing. Come on in. No, it's not going with you. And your bank account isn't going. There's some, can I tell you the one thing that is going with you to heaven? The one thing that's going with you to heaven, friends, is who you've become in Jesus Christ. That's what, what the Spirit of God has done in you. That's what's going with you to heaven. That's why when Paul is talking about this very subject in Galatians chapter 6, he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but what matters, what counts, is the new creation. Now, why does he say that? Because circumcision was part of the Old Testament law. He's like, guess what? In heaven, I got news for you. Circumcision ain't going to be a big deal, all right? Thank, thank God, right? That we're not talking about that still, right? It, all that law stuff, that's not going to be a big deal. He says what matters is, what's going to count is what lasts. And what lasts is who you become through the Holy Spirit in this life. That's what lasts. That's what matters. And one of the reasons why relating to God through his Spirit is so much better than just striving for standards is because you're transformed from the inside out and the way that God transforms you is what you take with you to heaven. I was listening to a couple of leaders. I'm a huge fan of Kerry Newhoff's leadership podcast. I don't know if you guys know that leadership podcast, but I, I love it. I listen to it every week. I heard a couple of leaders on their different episodes recently. And these guys have been very successful and, and, and all that, and, and he was asking them, what is your number one goal in the coming 12 months? Great question, right? And I, I was expecting, I mean, just your mind start filling in the blanks. I start thinking they're gonna say, conserve cash. That's what we, tough time economically, conserve cash. Number one goal, keep people paid. Keep our, not have to maybe let any employees go. Number one goal. Maybe number one goal is look for new opportunities during this difficult time. I wondered what they were gonna say. First guy is answered, answers this question. What's your number one goal? He's a Christian leader. Very established. You know what he says? My number one goal over the next 12 months is to be fully present to my friends and family. Fully present to my friends and family. He asks a different leader. Same question. What's your number one goal over the next 12 months? You know what this leader said? My number one goal over the next 12 months is to become a more loving person. To be more loving towards my, the company that I lead and, and work for. And I heard those guys, and they didn't answer in the way I expected. 
But as they answer those questions, I realize they got it. Because when they get to heaven, guess what? Their company ain't coming with them, everybody. When they get to heaven, the bottom line isn't coming with them. Their title and account. When they get to heaven, what's going to go with them is who they became in Christ. And can I suggest to you that the reason why relating to God through his spirit is so much better than just striving to get the right boxes on the list checked off is for this reason that when you relate to God through his spirit, that is what leads to life. Number one, everybody say life. And number two, that's what produces change that carries all the way into eternity. So much better. I don't know about you. I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. Do you want more of the Holy Spirit, church? I want more of the Holy Spirit. I want the kind of change that, that, that gives me new desires and empowers those. I want the kind of change in my life that I say, I'm becoming the kind of man that more of my life is going to end up going to heaven, more of who I've become, because God's going to purge all the nasty stuff. But more of my life that I've invested in, it's going to last because he's changed me by his spirit. I want more of that. Now, maybe your heart hungers in the same way mine does to say, you know what, God? I wanna, I wanna be a little bit done with re- just striving for standards. I wanna move towards, I wanna relate to you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I wanna get practical for a few moments and just say, how do we do that? How do we do that? And so I'm gonna just take you through three things real quick that Paul mentions right in the text. First one is, comes in verse 16. How do, how do we relate to God through the Spirit? Here's the answer. Watch this. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. If you want to relate to God through his spirit, number one thing you need to do, everyone, is turn to Jesus. Remember what? I'm going to come back to where I started. The the way it works is you turn to Jesus, and the moment you give your life to him, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. Jesus, I'm, I'm asking from now on, you call the shots. The moment you give your life to Jesus, God the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in your life. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Number one, turn to Jesus. That means, by the way, that you give up on this mentality that says the bad stuff I do is what keeps me apart from God and the good stuff I do is what gets me to God and you move to a place where you realize it's only Jesus Christ that gets me to God. You see the difference? It's not my bad stuff keeps me away, good stuff gets me or earns me there. No, my relationship is based on Jesus and Jesus alone. Number one, turn to Jesus. Number two, verse 17. He says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit, oh, I gotta do it one more time and you gotta give me your best brave heart if you know that movie. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is. Oh, that's, I feel like we had a bunch of Male and female Mel Gibson's in this place right there. That was nice. That was nice. There is free. Second thing you need to do, step into the freedom of the Spirit of God. Step into the spirit, freedom of the Spirit of God. Now, here's the truth about human nature works. Here's what I've experienced. I've had days where I wake up and I say, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you that the relationship I have with you is not conditional on if I'm living, having my best day or I'm having my worst day. Thank you that my relationship with you is in fact founded on Christ and Christ alone. Have those days and then watch this. The very next day, I'll be like, now God, how am I doing? Let's see, I've been good with my Bible reading. I've been uh, at church. I mean, that's kind of my job. So I've been at church. That seems like it's working. And uh, I've been fasting f- fairly regularly and I've uh, been, been pretty generous and I've, uh, I've, com- I've been compassionate and I'm, I guess I'm doing okay. And what did I do? I drifted right back to the standard. You see that? That's human nature, everybody. That's religion. Religion goes right back. Am I getting, all- check, 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 check. Did I get all the right, bo- oh, I guess I'm good with God because I checked at least eight out of 10 boxes. I mean, start getting a seven out of 10, Ooh, I don't know. But that's, that's going right back. And listen, how many of you discovered if you don't put a list like that on yourself, have you discovered somebody else will put a list like that on you? They'll do the work for you. <laughs> it's fantastic. You can be like, I'm not gonna put a list on myself, but watch this. Somebody around you say, well, if you're a real Christian, then you'll make sure you say these right words and you will not make sure you don't say these phrases or don't say those phrases. If you're the right Christian, if you're a good Christian, you make sure you do this and you don't do that. That's, that's the only way you can really be with Christ. And if you're actually a Christian, that means you, you wear a mask if you have any care about people. No, if you're a real Christian, you don't wear a mask because that means you have faith and they'll put all this on you, right? All these things, right? I got news for you, everybody. Galatians chapter five, Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So watch this, stand firm then, and don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. 
If you're in Christ, it's time to be done with slavery. Get done with living for the list, everyone. You are a free person in Christ. It's time to say, I'm done with the check boxes. My relationship with God is based on what Jesus did, not how good I'm living today or yesterday or tomorrow. I gotta say one more thing, thank you. I gotta say one more thing on this topic of freedom. Because here's what I think happens a lot of times we hear the word freedom. I, everybody loves the word freedom, don't we? I, like, I've never met some. No, I'm anti-freedom. I really, I am, stand, I, I stand opposed on principle to freedom, right? That is, is no good. No, we love freedom. I think we love freedom uh, because at, at some level when we hear that word, we take it to mean. Freedom means I get to do what I want, when I want, how I want, where I want, with whom I want, right? Freedom in Christ, amen. Peace out. <laughs> and I just need you to know, that's not how Paul thinks about freedom. He, he said this beautiful truth, don't let it yourself be yoked again by slavery at the beginning of chapter five, but then just a few verses later, watch what he says. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Mm. Mm. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. I'm gonna put something before you right now and somebody just has to say, oh, that's good, afterwards. Or, or you can say, mmm. Those are your two options, right? <laughs> the limit to your freedom is what expresses love to your neighbor. The limit to your freedom is what expresses love to your neighbor. That's what he means when he says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Freedom in Christ doesn't mean, woo, hoo, hoo. I get to do what I want whenever I want, where I go, oh my gosh, I get to do. No, 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 that freedom in Christ is, he's given you freedom to serve people in Jesus' name in a way that expresses love to them. I need to say that. Now, let me move on, Fan a point. We're just talking about, again, how do we relate to God through his spirit? How do we pull that off? How does it happen? I wanna give you one last point. This is one of the most important of all. It comes from actually verse 18. I wanna tell you, if you wanna to relate to God through his spirit rather than just striving to standards, third thing is this. You, need, you and I, we need to contemplate God's glory and thereby, thereby be transformed by his spirit. We need to look right at God. We need to gaze into who he is, his character. It's contemplate God is another way of saying worship. And we need to be transformed through the experience of worship. It's very important to me today that you don't hear what I'm saying as if to mean that godly character and godly behavior is unimportant. That is not what I'm saying in the slightest. But how that godly character and behavior emerges is important. One of my most favorite stories in the Bible comes from Isaiah chapter six. And I would, if there was one bit of homework I could give you, it would be sometime read Isaiah six after today. Isaiah 6, uh, the prophet Isaiah, who, who was a good guy. You know, he, he's a nice guy. We all want, we want to be, I'm a nice person, I'm pretty sure, you know. He was a good guy. And he has this encounter with God in worship. He contemplates God's glory. It's so interesting. He's taken back. He's in this moment where he sees God in worship. And he's, and, and, and the fullness of God's glory and splendor is made evident to Isaiah. And right after he has this experience of contemplating God's glory, the very first words out of his mouth are, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. I, he has a worship moment with God. Watch this. And the next thing happens is, woe is me, God. I just am realizing, I've been a pretty good guy, but I'm noticing I've said some stupid things, some inappropriate things. I've been posting some stuff on social media that, you know what, come to think about it, maybe wasn't most helpful for the community. That's what I said. And I look around and I thought we were doing all right, Isaiah says, but now after seeing you, God, and seeing your glory, I'm realizing that the, I got some, my community is actually doing some stuff and saying some stuff that maybe isn't so good either. But here's what strikes me about Isaiah's example in that moment. It's not, it's not that he says, woe is me. It's the fact that he is convicted of his brokenness and he is convicted of his community's brokenness. And God never says one thing about brokenness. All that happens is Isaiah has such a moment with God 
such a, a, a moment encountering God's glory and worship that he is spontaneously convicted. He spontaneously sees the places in his life that aren't like where they ought to be. And he says, God, I need to move in that direction. I need to make some changes. Could I suggest to you, some of us today, we need to start contemplating God a little bit more in our lives. If I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you one principle, and this is so good. Oh, I hope you live it out and live into it. Watch this, this is so good. You start looking like whatever you spend your time looking at. I'm gonna say that a second time. Read this one with me. I, I thought we wanna get this rooted. Read it with me out loud, even at home. You start looking like whatever you spend time looking at. You get a kid who plays sports, they've got a famous figure that they follow in that same sport, and all of a sudden that kid's like, yo, I gotta get the shoes, dad. I gotta get the shoes, right? I don't care that they're a million dollars, dad. It's the only way I can be at the level I need to be. Oh, and they got the sweatband right here. And if they're a tight sport, they got the tights. And I saw kids yesterday at lacrosse, tights, one leg full, and just one leg to the knee, right? Because that helps when it's just to the knee on one side, right? It helps, right? You... You start looking like whatever you're looking at. And if the guy you're looking at has got one knee, right? oh, I can't put him down all the way, right? And some of us, we need to start looking at God and watch what happens. You start contemplating God. You start spending more time in worship. You start using his word, not to just memorize standards and lists, but to actually see who the character of God is. And now watch this, everybody. You start to see transformation in your life through the spirit. And now you want to read the word of God because you see who good, how good God is and you want to encounter him right now. He starts changing you. You want to be generous, not because somebody told you to, but you go, oh my goodness, my God is a generous God and it convicts me and I want to be generous like my God. And I look in the word and I see my God is a God of justice and racial equity. And that matters to me now, not because it's in the culture, not because I'm getting pressured, because I see I got a God of justice. And now I'm encountering this God of justice and God is doing something inside my heart. Are you with me, everybody, today? That's what the power of contemplating God, worshiping. I just fix my eyes on him. And if you want to relate to God through his spirit, that's what we need to do. Oh, God. We spend a lot of time looking at a lot of stuff. Oh, God, will we start looking more at you? Let's pray. Father, we want to come to you today. We recognize there are different ways to relate to you. Some lead to life. Some lead to being cut off from you and death. I pray for my friends who are here in this place, who are watching online, and we pray, God, would you help us to relate to you prim primarily through your spirit. We want, we want to be in touch with you, Father. We, we want to be in a place where, where we, we experience life through the spirit, where you're renewing us from the inside. We're not checking off boxes because we have to. We're embracing godly behavior because we want to. It might not be easy, but we've got your spirit in us producing fruit and fighting for us, producing fruit that lasts all the way into eternity. Father, we just want to say, we want to give up on relating to you by just striving through standard for standards. We want to interact with you through your spirit. Let's just stay in this place of prayer for a moment longer. Maybe you're hearing this message right now and you have not yet put your trust in Jesus. And I'm telling you, you say, I like that idea of relating to God through his spirit, but the only way that can happen is if you are willing to give your life to Jesus. And so I wanna just ask, I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I wanna ask you right now, if you wanna put your trust in Jesus, I wanna ask you just to wave at me real quick. If you're online, maybe you put some praise hands up or some kind of high five thing or something online. But right now, if you're here today and you wanna put your trust in Jesus, could you just wave at me real quick and let me know? I'm not gonna call you up. Just give me, give me your attention real quick and I'll let you know. Got you, awesome, God bless you, awesome. Anybody else put your trust in Jesus today? I'm gonna pray right now. And whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person, I wanna just encourage you, agree with this prayer in your own heart. And so Father, we acknowledge it's very easy to try to relate to you through performance. We, we've been guilty of thinking we can either earn our way to you by good behavior or we're distanced from you because of bad. And today we wanna put our trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. He's the author of our salvation. We ask God that you would forgive us through Jesus' bloodshed on the cross. Make us new in this moment through his resurrection and beginning right now, Holy Spirit, would you come to dwell in us that we could experience you, relate to you in a way that leads to life and life eternal. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's affirm some folks who took steps towards Jesus for the very first time online in person. We're so excited for you.
Well, what a great teaching by Pastor Brian, and I want you to know all of heaven is rejoicing if you decided to pray that prayer and make a decision to follow Jesus. And Man, we're so excited for you. We believe this is the best decision you ever could have made. And we would love to walk with you in this new spiritual journey you're going to be on. And so I want to encourage you to do this. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, whether you're viewing online or you're here in person, I want you to text new decision to the number on the screen. And it's going to be the simplest, easiest way for us to connect with you and to journey with you on this, on this walk with Jesus and to help you take next steps uh, on this walk of faith with Christ. And we want to be able to be the, a part of your journey in that. So make sure you do that. Otherwise, it's at the time in our gathering where we want to give and receive the offering and we actually celebrate that here at Engedi because we believe God does incredible things through our generosity yeah and we're so grateful for all of you who continue to give week in and week out whether you've been given for the first time or you've been given for years and there's plenty of ways you can give we always have the option to give online and if you want to give in person whether through cash or check we have some drop boxes over by the barn doors that you can put that in over there but church I, I want to say from from our staff and our church family thank you Thank you for being people who give generously and faithfully, who believe in the mission of Jesus, that you know the resources God has given you, he uses to advance his kingdom and to, and to love people in need. And we so appreciate you modeling that and inspiring our faith. So thank you so much for being a generous people. Well, hey, I think we should stand up and let's worship together as we receive and give this offering today. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, a roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. be back today. It was awesome to be back in, uh, in Getty preaching again. And I um, want to say before you leave today, if you uh, want somebody to pray for you, then our prayer team is back in that corner. And again, God, uh, God's not taking a break on answering prayers. So feel free to stop by them. I'm going to pray us out today though. Father, I want to say as we go in this place, you've given us a way to relate to you through your spirit. And so now I pray, Father, that we would go out in the joy and freedom of Christ and that we would live and model that freedom to everyone around us. Might we contemplate your glory and become like you, that we can have the confidence in what we are doing, how we are relating to you. We'll both last, Father, into all of eternity and we'll bring life. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for being here today.
told me I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be anymore. And you said I can leave my heart on my sleeve. That for everyone to see. You Lord. All of the things, all of the things, all of the things that I used to hide. I gone away, faded away. And I'm changed from the inside out. Sure, I'm free. Your love is louder than the thunder in the sky, so much bigger than the lies in me. All of the things, all of the things, all of the things that I used to hide have gone away, faded away, and I've changed from the inside. And now 